I'm working at FEDAREN, the European Federation of Energy Agencies and Regions for Energy and, uh, and Environment. And today uh, I will be the moderator for this 10th uh, stakeholder forum uh, on investigating the potential of uh, photovoltaics for public buildings. Um, but um, first, I will uh, introduce the context of today's event by pre presenting really uh, quickly ePlanet project objectives and the stakeholder forum format. Then I will detail today's agenda and we will start with the presentations just, just after. Um, so ePlanet has four main objectives, which are uh, to create a transparent and coherent harmonized uh, information sharing platform and a database plans, which include best practices and indicators of energy measures, energy transition measures. Uh, and in addition to the creation of the platform, our aim is also to develop uh, a collaborative framework for the development and updating of energy transition plans and to consolidate the, and institutionalize a network, including uh, multi-level stakeholders. And one way to entertain this network is through the stakeholder forums. Um, there are a series of online meetings, as you can see here, uh, a screenshot of, the, of a past uh, stakeholder forum. Um, and the aim is to share the early results of the project with potential users or beneficia beneficiaries. And so far, we organized 10 uh, forums, including today's one, on a variety of topics such as uh, data display and dissemination, governance concepts, uh, energy savings, and energy communities, for example, among others. Uh, and we were able to yeah, get inspired yeah, no, by. Um, no. Uh, by many uh, external initiatives, and we also presented different developments of the ePlanet platform. So now I will just introduce you to today's agenda. Um, so during the development phase of the ePlanet platform, several use cases were explored, and this stakeholder and in this stakeholder forum, uh, we will focus on the use case dedicated to the analysis of photovoltaic potential of public buildings. We will first describe the ePlanet methodology to estimate the PV potential uh, on a rooftop, uh, but also the challenges and lessons learned from uh, our experience uh, with EASC, uh, one of our pilots. Uh, partner uh, in the Zlin region in, in Czech Republic. Uh, so this presentation will, will be uh, will be done by Jaume Asensio from, from Simne. Uh, then, as it is the transition in ePlanet stakeholder forums, we will look for inspiration from other stakeholders. So we will first, first uh, get Solar Power Europe insights on public leadership in renewables development, mm -hmm. and it will be uh, presented uh, by Jonathan Bonadio. Uh, from Solar Power Europe. And then we will have a presentation uh, by Marco Cava uh, from Regia uh, that will share experience on the Zagreb Energy Info Center development. Uh, so I think that now we can uh, we can go directly to the to the presentation. So I will leave the floor to Jaime Asensio for the first presentation on the ePlanet methodology um, used for the for the ePlanet platform. So how may uh, the floor is yours if you want to to share your screen? Yeah. Uh, yes, I will be presenting. Um, all right, you should all be seeing my screen right now. And yes, as Nade say, yes. I'm I'm Jamal Asensio. Okay, perfect. I'm from Thimne and with uh, Gerard Laguna also from Thimne. We've been working in this tool to estimate the photovoltaic potential on rooftops and our pilot were public buildings from the Slim region. And we'll talk a little bit about what we have done. So uh, first one, we'll talk a little bit what our, about what our main goal was, which data we had, the solution we we worked on, what results we got, and also, as Nade said, uh, the challenges and lessons learned along the way. So firstly, we had to develop a program. We use a Python program to convert, to obtain the photovoltaic estimation that a building could have based on LiDAR data. To do that, we 
we made a Python program based also on the QG software, which is a software used for working with geographical data, such as LIDAR and also the cadaster that we had to do to identify each buildings we were working on. And the outcome of this program is the simulation of the photovoltaic energy that each rooftop in that building could have. So our data, we had two types of data, LIDAR data and cadaster. And as for the LIDAR, um, it's a scanning of the of all the Slint region, sampling points and getting the height of each point, kind of getting like this image in which each, each pixel, as to speak, is color coded to the corresponding height. So yellow areas are higher buildings and this darker blue are ground level points. And this was our input data. And our secondary data was the cadaster, which was used to limit the, bu the buildings kind of we can compare it to a cookie cutter as to just have a surface limit and limit the points that are inside our, inside our building. And with these two data, we could limit with what our building were and use that to obtain the photovoltaic energy later on. And this is, an, this is the algorithm we developed, the steps we did. We will go in further detail in each one in the next slides. But basically, our, we had like five main steps and one secondary step in which we firstly, from, um, from the raw LiDAR data, we obtain the shape of the building and the points that belong inside the building only, and we kept only those. From that, we applied an algorithm to identify the planes that form the rooftops of the building. Uh, once we had each um, a list of planes, we applied some post-processing techniques to refine the results and apply some detail. With the definitive planes, we compute the shading of the neighboring elements, and then we we use the, that shading information to estimate the solar energy that each rooftop could, could have. Those are like the five main steps. And below, there's the secondary step of generating the 3D model, which was used to develop, to obtain the shading matrix of each of each building. Going into detail, um, step by step, the first thing we had to do was to um, was to get the points inside the building based on the leader on the LiDAR data. Think each LiDAR data was a square of maybe two kilometers each side. And using the cadaster, we kept only the points that were inside our building. So each of these images is a building. And it was later used for the next steps of the algorithm. But and since this was using uh, geographical data, in this, in this step, we also obtained the 3D model of the neighborhood which is this 3D shape yellow here that is used for shading in the next steps. Once we had the points that were only inside the, that belong inside the building, we applied one of our algorithm to identify the planes. This algorithm is RANSAC, and this performs an stochastic linear regression, which basically what it does is tries different planes and see which ones fit best with a with the given data. Um, we tune some aspects of this algorithm, and we apply also some preprocessing techniques, like for example, splitting in height groups. Here on the right, we see the histograms of the heights that, that the buildings on the left had, and this we can see pretty clearly that there are some very distinct regions, especially in the building in the middle, that are two flat rooftops, one above the other. And it was used to cut into different height groups and made our identification easier. Moving on, once we had the points grouped in different clusters, each cluster belonging to a plane, uh, we applied some pre plane preprocessing techniques. These were two kinds. The first thing was refining the plane identification, such as if two planes were too close and had similar um, orientation and tilt, they were merged. If there were some discontinuities between a plane, because there were a region in which there were no points, it was split. And if were, 
there were planes that didn't fulfill some quality criteria, such as a minimum area and minimum density of LiDAR points, these were deleted because we consider them not to be valid. Once we had what would be the definitive planes, we applied some detail by first uh, piercing holes in case we had empty areas in which there were no leader points, but the whole plane could not be split. We placed a hole in these images you see here. The, um, the first one in the middle is because it was a hit um, hit exhaust and the LiDAR scanning didn't detect anything, so we had to draw a hole to say that to tell the program that there could not be any solar um, panel in this area. And in the image on the right, these smaller holes were windows. Since the windows um, pierced the plane and didn't belong to the plane, we had to take that into account and we placed the hole where the window was supposed to be. And this is our final results of planes identification. This is what we consider the ground truth for the building. And we use that information to estimate the shading of the neighboring elements. For each plane, what we did was sample, uh, sample some points from that plane. And for each point, we would send rays, beams of light, in all the direction, in all the possible directions. Um, we would do that in the middle of the 3D model that you see here. And if the ray intersected with anything outside the, of, the neighbor, of the 3D model, we would consider that that direction is shaded and, and mark like a black square in our shading matrix. Um, for each sample point, we generated a matrix like the one we see on the picture. So this um, dark blue area is the region of um, of altitudes and azimuts in which there is no sunlight because there's an obstacle in the middle. And we did that for every point. And then we moved on to our uh, solar estimation per se, which is was used using Python, which is an open source library from Python. And for each point that we sampled the shading matrix, we fed that into our program again and estimated the potential energy. And the final results are the heat maps that we can see here, which um, the brighter the color, the more yearly production there would be. To comment a little bit on each one, in the first one on the left, we can see this blue rooftop is so dark because it's facing north, so it's north, so it's not, it won't have any so interesting to place photovoltaic panels there. And the ones with the brighter yellow are facing south, which is where it would be most interesting to place um, our panels. Also, for example, in the building in the middle, there are two flat rooftops, one above the other. The one in the the smaller one, in one is the one in a, is the highest one. So therefore, it casts a shadow in the in the one below. This makes this um, this gradient we see of colors where the closer they are to the um, to the higher rooftop, the more shaded they are, and only this north and west areas are shaded because the south, since since we will since it is our interest to put panels on the south because there's a higher production, it doesn't have any shade from north. And here on the right, it's a similar case. And now moving on to some results of the EASC buildings we have. We had we had 377 public administration buildings of the Slint region. Out of those, 35 could not be simulated. I'll go more on that later. And 57 were not simulated because were subsets of, of another building. So they were kind of duplicate coordinates. So we only simulated simulated them once. Finally, we have 295 buildings that were successfully simulated. And we made an interactive visualization tool to, to see the results. Now, if I may, you should all be seeing right now uh, the map, the same map that was on the slides. Just to show a little bit how it works, we have all the buildings that we were given. The blue ones were successfully simulated, the red ones couldn't be simulated, 
and we can go anywhere, we can zoom in, and you can see, for example, uh, if we click on one of our buildings, we see this pop-up of a PDF report, which tells us some basic information. Um, we can also go over not successful buildings and see why it wasn't successful. In this case, it was, well, in all cases, the simulation was not successful because the LiDAR data didn't fulfill our quality requirements. And we can go to anyone and open that report in a new tab to see it better. And here we have, it's the same report for any building, the identifier. In the case there, it was a duplicate, all the identifiers with the same coordinates, some basic information about the location, as well as the LiDAR data that we had, the rooftops that were identified, color coded to see which represented each one and some the basic parameters we had to take into account later for the simul for our simulation. Then a summary on the photovoltaic production. So we separate it into different classes based on quality of the yearly outcome. So the brighter the color, the more yearly energy we had. And then we have this with further detail for each plane. Um, we have split it into quality groups or into production groups. So we can see for each plane how, how many areas it has for every energy level. Um, that's our report that we had. We made it for all the buildings that were successfully simulated. And then if I go back to the slides, this is the same as I showed you right now. Uh, and then moving on on our challenges and lessons that we that we faced, as I mentioned, there were some buildings that we could not simulate. Um, these were basically because lidar data was missing or was too scarce. Um, to give a reference, most buildings or the ones that yielded the best results had at least one point per square meter. But there were buildings which were the ones that we not simulated that had less than 0 0.5 points per square meter. This density is too low. Um, this one here on the right is a clear example that any we cannot identify a plane based on this leader alone. So those ones were the ones that we didn't simulate. Also, the ones we did simulate, we came across other challenges. Here, um, we had some challenges first that um, we had some buildings that were not were not flat to speak. So here this we have this semicircle rooftop, which and our algorithm was designed only to identify um, flat surfaces. We, the solution we had, which was actually found by the algorithm on its own, was to segment the flat the rooftop into flat areas. So I yes, into flat surfaces. So each one of these color regions is a plane. It's not a it's not a part of a circle. But it's each one of these is tangent to the uh, to the roof in that area. And this was found by the algorithm just and it was treated as if it was a normal building. But it was a challenge that we we came across, and also something that we had that we came across was um, planes that overlap with each other. Here we can see that these two blue planes were identified and had some overlapping regions. Um, some of them were handled, but it was at some point it was hard to to define a, a general rule that could apply for everyone as to which overlap belong to one plane and which overlap belong to the other. So there are some tiny overlaps in our simulations and in our results that are that have remained as such because we have not been able to define a criteria to to split them. Also, um, the algorithm works best with play, with buildings that have four or five roof, rooftops and at most. But we were given some really complicated buildings, such as the one 
here this image on the right is was treated just like a building and we had to intervene and aid the program and split it in different sub buildings as to speak and to the, so we develop an interactive tool which is this image here in which we had the satellite image the lidar skater on scattered on top of it and then we drew by hand this these polygons so to split each one in a sub building as to speak and each sub, -build, sub building was identified on its own this helped a lot in in the identification process and it's a challenge that we came across and we had to point out finally um what are the outcomes of this project we did and the work we we did well first we had to handle different coordinate reference systems and work with geographical data which is has this extra complication when working with them and also we had to use external software and we could not rely on leon python alone as per the algorithm we used to identify the planes we not within the standard use of this algorithm is usually to just do it entirely random entirely stochastic but we try to guide it using information of the neighboring points so we try to feed the points we had uh, a most a slope which was the most common found and we tried to also fit a point by by its neighbors so it was not entirely random but it was guided also as a, as we mentioned um not only we did this the identification of each planes but later on we did a refinement process to make sure that our results were best were as best as possible um, also, as I just pointed out, for specific cases, we had to kind of give give a hand to the program and draw which areas were each subset of the buildings, because for more com most complicated buildings, the program was stuck identifying the planes. So we had to develop this quick tool to to draw the areas of subsets of buildings. And finally, well, regarding the photovoltaic potential and the simulation that we did. This was achieved using external software and external libraries. In our case, we used the SAM library, which is from the, which is open source and it, which is from the National Renewable, Renewable Energy Lab from North America. And finally, in any future improvement, improvements this project could have, um, well, the main challenge that I thought is the plane identification. So this is something that should, could be further worked on. And also um, we, the shading calculations could be optimized because it's a very, very time consuming and resource consuming process. It works on its own and doesn't need any intervention. And once we run the program, we know that the results will be fine and there won't be any errors, but it's very time consuming and any improvement in the computation would be welcome. We need something that could be work on in the future. That's it for my presentation. I hope everything was as clear as possible. Uh, thank you everyone for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, Jaume. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the, of the forum. Um, but if you have uh, any clarification question or really short uh, question, you can you can uh, ask it uh, now um, with your mic or on the on the chat. Also on the chat, you can see that I've put uh, a link to Slido uh, because we will use Slido for the Q&A session at the end of the forum. So you can uh, already type your question if uh, if you want. Um, so I don't know if there's any clarification question. Um, it don't don't seem to have any. Uh, so I think we can then uh, um, follow up with the with the rest of the of the agenda. Now we will have uh, two presentation uh, from um, external stakeholders. Oh, I see something on the chat. Uh, sh shall I answer now? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'll just go back to that respective slide. Um, it's done by place 
the whole detection is done by placing a grid over the building and checking if in the square in the respective square of the grid if there are points or not if there aren't any points in that square of the grid it is considered to be a hole and that's also the reason why the, all the holes are kind of rectangular because they come from a grid Thank you. We have another question, uh, which is the accu uh, accuracy of the calculation of solar energy potential from Javier. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but what, but what they mean by accuracy, um, this, the simulation is done, con is the, the output we get is the hourly output output in a whole year and so we have this 20 the generation of 24 hours for 365 days and yeah i meant uh, sorry <laughs> no, no, no. i meant about because you said you were not sure what i was meaning um how accurate are the the modeling that you do of the buildings is so so that you you get uh yeah like a rough estimation or a more really a realistic estimation of the potential that you can capture? Well, um, since we fit the thing, we fit to the program um, the information about the plane and about the shading. So we don't go into the aspects of the solar panels per se. So we just go with the, what the, the default values of our, of the SAM software. So we don't have this extra take on what the accuracy is, but um, the results are meant to be trustworthy and taking into account that this works by like a hint map for density. So when we see here these generation levels, it's the output in is the energy output per square meter. So it's interesting to consider each plane like a map in which later if we draw panels over it, we can estimate the power of each panel by matching the color to the to the density that is associated with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Javier, for your question. Maybe now we can go to the second part of the of the forum on the right on time, <laughs> uh, on the inspiration from other stakeholders. And I would now leave the floor to, to Nathan Bonadio from Solar Power Europe uh, to tell us more about public leadership in renewables development. Um, so, Jonathan, the, the floor the floor is yours if you want to share your screen. Yeah, thanks indeed, uh, Nadej, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just before I start, Nadej, uh, I have what, 10 minutes? Yes, 10 minutes okay, more or less. And yeah. Very good. So, Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Stakeholder Forum. I'm Jonathan Bonadio, Senior Policy Advisor at Solar Power Europe. And this morning, I will have the pleasure to accompany you for uh, a journey on the European solar, European rooftops, and also public buildings. So I will start my presentation by, I think, providing you um, an overview of what's happening for solar across Europe. And then we're going to deep dive into what it means for buildings and especially for public buildings. But before I start my presentation, I would like to start something with a figure, which is actually quite a striking figure, uh, 263 gigawatts. This is the power that has been, that is currently installed in Europe in terms of solar. It's the equivalent of 263 nuclear reactor or around 50, 60, nuclear power plants. So this is a huge capacity that is installed. And also just to be, also to give you an overview, this is only just begun. This is only the beginning of the rollout of solar power in Europe. So what we can see in terms of total installed capacity, I said there was 263 gigawatts. There has been a 40% year-over-year growth for the three 
consecutive years, um, which is actually majorly driven by the increase of electricity prices because solar represents a viable financial alternative for households, for companies, for uh, factories, and also for utility scale solar installations. Currently in Europe, uh, I guess it's not a big, doesn't come as a big surprise for you, but the major markets for solar power, for so both solar power are Germany, followed by Spain, Italy, the Netherlands, France and Poland. So these countries have been the highest rate of installing of, of a total uh, PV installation in 2023. Uh, and the fastest growth was Germany, Netherlands, Italy and Spain, and Spain also driven by power purchase agreements. Um, this is good news. This is very good news for, for the solar sector and for the energy system in general. But uh, it would be a fairy tale if it was to continue. But actually, the growth is expected to slow in the coming years, and we will witness lower uh, installation growth, 11 to 90 percent in the next uh, in the next years, reaching uh, a, a bit more than 500 uh, gigawatts uh, cumulative installation by 2027. So I, I wanted to show you also a bit because this is these are raw numbers. This is only what has been installed, what is installed in Europe. But for individual countries, what does it mean? And this, I think, it's a very interesting um, statement that comes from uh, the uh, solar installation. Uh, the countries that are leading in terms not about installed capacity, but installed capacity per capita are Germany, uh, Netherlands, sorry, further Netherlands, then Germany, and then Denmark, um, followed by Belgium and Estonia. And I think this is a very important dynamic because as you can see, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, Belgium, Estonia, they're all northern countries. So it's not where the sun is shining the most that we have the highest rate per capita. It's actually mostly where the electricity prices are highest and where the enabling framework is the most favorable. Spain only came sixth and Greece only came seventh. So here you see that there is also an untapped potential in these southern countries that we have seen. And what we will see in the future is that probably Germany will take over the first place in terms of what per capita. But Netherlands is still a solid competitor when it comes to this analysis. So yeah, I just wanted to show you this to give you a bit of perspective of the member states, even though sometimes you see that the um, installation rate is lower, it could mean that uh, it's actually a high per capita ratio. As I said, this has only just begun. And on the graph here, you can see uh, the current installation rate, the current installation 2023, and so 263 gigawatts, and the projections on the different curves. So I, I wanted to focus only on, on two elements so far, which are the curves in red, 902 gigawatts, and the and the curve which is in dot in the blue dotted line, 750 gigawatts. These are the numbers by 2030 that we could reach according to the industry. So according to the industry, 900 gigawatt and according to the commission, according to the commission, 750 gigawatt of solar panels. But what we see actually in Europe is that most member states, they have revised their targets upwards, their national energy and climate plans, but they are still falling short of these targets because we have between, we have around 600 gigawatt total capacity installed when we sum up the um, NECPs and national energy and climate plans, um, which still remains below the target. So here we have a gap and this gap we have to fill in uh, via updating the national energy and climate plans, but also via uh, pushing for more enabling measures such as grid and permitting for solar power. Now, how about rooftop PV in this picture? 
So rooftop PV is actually currently still the highest contributor to solar installation in Europe. 66% of annual capacity in 2023 were rooftop PV and around the same figure is the total capacity installed. So solar uh, rooftop solar is actually dominating the market in terms of installation. The growth was spectacular uh, by the next year, 47% for residential, 60% for commercial and 45% for industrial. So really a lot of deployment here. And what we estimate is that we can basically double uh, the total installed capacity from 170 gigawatt and the end of 2023 to 340 in 2027. Um, this is also helped by new business cases uh, with a collective model, collective self-consumption, collective uh, energy sharing, and also to note that BIPV, so building integrated photovoltaics, is currently a niche market still in Europe, but potentially can grow in the future. So, Bola, if you have to uh, to keep only one figure in mind from this slide, 66% rooftop solar of total installation. And when it comes to public buildings, uh, there is a potential for public buildings. And in this graph here, I mean, I assume that uh, maybe not all of you uh, understand German, so I will translate it. This is a graph from Agora Energiewende. Uh, I put you the link in the slide so you can have a look. It's a very interactive graph, very interesting. Um, but this is the potential of solar PV on uh, large roofs by category of usage. Uh, and um, the first bars in the, I will I will let you look at the, the graph on the right. So the, um, the pink graph um, is the technical potential for rooftop above 500 square meters by type of usage. So the first potential, the first one, the first two big large bars are the industrial pro uh, product projective uh, companies and the um, household, so the, the, the housing uh, potential. So this is the highest potential with between 30 and 35 gigawatts potential. Um, and the public building is the, the, the bar that I highlighted in green here. It's around seven gigawatt uh, potential for all public building, which means that we are slightly above 5% of total capacity being installed on public building, which is quite good actually in Germany, which is quite good and which might be quite similar in other parts of Europe. We didn't have the data for other parts of Europe, but there is definitely a potential on public building. And talking about potential, I wanted to show you one very concrete example uh, of what has been done at public level for public buildings, the solar click, um, project by the city of Brussels, which will launch in 2017, uh, which was covering PV panel on 85,000 square meters of public rooftops by 2022. And this managed to decrease CO2 emissions of around 500, uh, 5,500 uh, tons. So it's also something which has, which is happening with some municipalities have taken forward. And this is here what I wanted to highlight for public buildings. So there is a potential and there are municipalities that are already uh, grasping this potential. Um, now to be a bit to go a bit deeper on integration of buildings, you know that we have the energy performance uh, of building directive, the EPBD with the social subject to approval. And um, this uh, this EPBD mandates um, uh, solar power is obliged to install solar powers on rooftops for new and public buildings from 2027, for residential, new residential building from 23, and for all public building that should be gradually equipped with solar by 2031. So this is really a big step ahead in terms of um, installation and will also boost the sector and reach our 340 gigawatt as expected. There are already uh, some, some um, standards in member states, so in nine member states. I don't want to go deeper on it, uh, but Belgium, Holland, Switzerland, for instance, have 
have uh, obligations on their rooftop. The good things with building integration is that um, the building integration of solar reduces cost because of economies of scale, because of reduced um, costs for in solar, like sales, marketing, because they all install together, so they have a whole package for the customer ready. Uh, it can um, it can increase the internal rate uh, return ratio from 10% to 18%, so almost double the internal return ratio via uh, reduction of costs. And last but not least, I wanted to share with you a bit about energy sharing. So it's currently possible in some parts of Europe, France, Portugal have adopted energy sharing as well. And the, the, the principle of energy sharing uh, as you can see this example, when you have solar panels on a stadium rooftop, which is shared with communities above, across uh, the, the, the sector, um, it's to make the nearby uh, citizens and consumers able to, to, to consume the electricity from a nearby facility. And here I don't want to go deeper into the detail of the, of the, of the, of the, um, of the graph, but as you can see, this is all something which is made possible although we had the market design and it makes potentially nearby consumers directly involved into solar PV project. And this is also a driver for uh, uh, the rollout of solar PV. Without further ado, I will leave the floor to the rest of the participants. I this. I'm a bit over time, so thanks for your patience and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, I will uh, directly give the floor um, to Marco uh, so that uh, we have uh, time for Q&A just after uh, his presentation. So Marco, the floor is yours. Sure, yep. Just to share the screen and go to the presentation. I hope that you can see it, yeah. Yes, Excellent. Uh, so uh, hello um, to everyone. My name is oh, sorry, Marco Chala. I'm the head of the energy department in the Northwest uh, Croatia Regional Cli uh, Climate Energy Agency. And today I will give you a short um, uh, introduction to our energy info center that we developed with the city of Zagreb and one private IT company called GDI. Uh, so this is still a um, uh, work in progress in many aspects, but just to give you the idea of, of what uh, we are doing. So as for the uh, content, first uh, I will give you a few slides on the introduction and present you two types of the applications that we are developing. One is the open or the free application. The other one is the advanced. It is also free, but you need uh, some, some sources, uh, some ways of um, um, advanced uh, login. Uh, but I will explain that and I will finish with the next steps. Uh, I will in parallel show you the slides and then just jump uh, to the application so that you can get a better, better uh, look on, on that. So uh, the, the, um, about the context is why are we even doing that is that the city of Zagreb adopted the official program in 2021 for the large scale integration of PV systems in the area of the cities. Uh, in the city, duration of the program is from 2022 to 2024. Hopefully, it will go to the 2025. And in, in one sentence, the final goal is until the end of 2024 or 25 to, in, to integrate a 50 megawatt of PV systems, all integrated. So we are all talking about the systems on the roof. Uh, the, the division between the, I would say, different uh, categories is that the public buildings will have 10 megawatt, industry and business sector is 30 megawatt, including city-owned companies, and then the private households and uh, multi-apartment buildings is 10 uh, megawatt. Public buildings, industry and business sector um, are assisted by our project PV Max. I don't know if you are um, familiar with that, but basically through the European Investment Bank project and through the ELENA program, um, uh, we are uh, giving them uh, free of charge assistance in technical, financial and uh, um, um, uh, law aspects, but I will not go too much into that. So um, 
this is um, uh, the applications for the um, uh, households and multi apartment buildings. I know that uh, uh, before um, um, uh, earlier presentations focused on the public buildings, but uh, we figure out that we will uh, uh, go into these investments for public buildings for industry. So our focus was how to trigger investments in private uh, households. And uh, we, we identified four different aspects. The first is the accurate estimations of potential. The second was it's free or at least free project documentation because people are always um, um, uh, very, um, 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 I would say, not happy when they have to pay for something um, regarding documentation. Uh, the third one is to ease the process of obtaining necessary permits because everything has to go via email or even by um, sending post and um, it's a very long process. And the last one is to uh, get the access to information about realistic investments costs and PV companies that are maybe operating in the area and maybe you have problems with finding them. So that's why we um, uh, looked at this and tried to create two different applications. The first one is the open um, or the free applications, as we call it. Um, uh, you will have the link here so you can check it uh, after by your own. And it is a free application for all users developed by the GDI and Regea. And the interesting thing is that um, we incorpor incorporated um, 3D layer of the, uh, of the city that we have. Um, um, and um, you can see it on, on this picture um, with the aim that you can select a rooftop that you want, any rooftop, uh, insert information about consumptions and price of the electricity. And uh, as a result, you get the size of the optimal PV system, which is um, boosted by our uh, calculations in the background uh, based on this PV Max project and lessons learned that we have. So those are not 100% correct, but um, uh, those are fairly good estimations because of the net metering that is operating in, in our households and everything else. So it's not um, a very complex calculations. And the second aspect of the results are energy and financial savings. So uh, it looks basically like this, that you can go uh, in the city, um, you can uh, find uh, any building. I will just pick a random one. Um, sorry, it is in Croatian, but I will try to 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 translate. You confirm this um, um, a roof. Um, you can select: Do you have one tariff or two tariffs? Usually, it is two tariff. And um, uh, you can select even if you have a one month uh, bill or for the whole period. Let's say that we uh, insert um, random uh, consumptions. And when you calculate, uh, uh, click uh, uh, calculate, you get some basic information about the size of the system, uh, what is the area that you need for the installation, uh, what are the capital investments, um, simple payback period, um, and some graphical graphical idea, uh, graphical uh, presentation of the results. So it's a very easy, a uh, tool uh, which um, basically takes from the database the area of the roof and and so on. So that's the first one, and it is open. Um, it is it is ongoing, and and people can use it. But um, now we we thought of um, uh, what we can um, do more because this is was relatively easy to implement. So we uh, moved to the advanced application, which is still work in progress. Uh, there are several parts that we are very proud of. The first is that um, you log in via national identification and uh, authentication system, uh, which is called S-Citizens or e in, in Croatian. With that, um, 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 you, um, uh, get, um, you can catch up all the uh, information about yourself and you do not have to type it, but also it is um, um, uh, all the requests are directly connected to, to your um, uh, identification uh, number. The second one is that we established the connection with national DSO. In Croatia, we have only one. So you can get real accurate data about the electricity consumption in your building. You don't have to estimate something. You get um, um, uh, information about consumption and about the prices. And the third one is that we assess uh, different scenarios. So uh, what was the goal behind this is that we 
uh, based on this inserted information, um, application performs some scenario analysis. You will see the screenshot of it. Uh, users select the desired case that they want from different options, and then the application generates the basic PV system design, which is aligned to our law of uh, how the system design um, in this first step needs to, to, to look like, and it sends directly through the application this request for permit to the DSO. And after several days, the DSO gives you the permit back through the, through the system. So um, we thought that this is maybe the, the crucial part of, of, of this whole process of the installation about the permits and everything else. Um, so this really is up the whole uh, process. Additional ability is that you can include the decarbonization of the heating system. Uh, basically, you select that you are heating on natural gas, you insert some information about the consumption and price, and then in these scenarios we calculate um, um, feasibility of changing those with um, heat pumps uh, or the electric uh, boilers. Um, here you can see how the login page looks like. So here you will see this um, small icon which leads you to this national identification and uh, authentication uh, system. So once when you go in the application, uh, you can select again the roof, um, then the, sorry, oh, then the system um, um, application um, directly um, uh, inputs the area of the roof and the useful area if you want to uh, adjust it. Maybe you don't want to, to analyze the whole roof. You can uh, set in the incline, which is again directly through the application and the orientation. Is it north, south, east or something else? And you insert the information about your uh, contact. So uh, these on the right are uh, um, directly generated because it is a 3D map of, of Zagreb, while here you can see that is only some number and the email address. Uh, here the, the check is if you are heating on the natural gas, so you can click on that and then the uh, application will, will recognize that and, and include that in the um, calculations. The next is that you can get the insert of the, oh, sorry, uh, insert of the information about the consumption. This can be used, um, this can be input uh, manually, but also there is a um, 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 icon, it is not showed here, where you can generate this in the co communication with the TSO. Uh, same goes for, for numbers. This is the number of your, um, uh, of your, um, 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 uh, measurement unit and so on. And below you can make the, uh, you can upload all the necessary information about the legality, uh, uh, legal aspects, some photos and, and so on. Um, uh, after that, the system generates um, um, uh, scenarios. I'm sorry that is, um, it is very um, still in the draft, so it is not a nice looking pictures. But you can see here option A, B, C, and D, which gives you some numbers about the size of the system um, in kilowatt peak and kilowatt, and some um, numbers um, such as uh, technical and financial uh, aspects. Once when you select the uh, the um, uh, your 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 desired case, so you can see here uh, that there are five of them. Uh, the system generates the basic system design and uh, directly sends it to the DSO. And after that, you can get the DSO um, uh, permit after a few few days. So that is um, uh, that is um, uh, as it is now. The last slide is what we are now trying to do. Uh, in the short term, we will improve definitely visual appearance because it is awful as it is now. It is only uh, in draft. We will connect it thoroughly with the cadastral information and improve this generated basic PV system design. So that's what we are working on now. In the long term, there are two main goals. Um, the first one is to create a place for communication between clients and companies. In other ways, we want to um, simulate a tendering process for the households where private clients will publish their system design, companies will submit their offers uh, for installation, and then private clients will accept or reject, and we will, the city of Zagreb will see that. On the other hand, we will 
create a central place for the city of Zagreb to monitor all the installation process that are done through this application. We will get the great insight for the future programming of financial funds. So maybe city will see that a lot of people are trying to, to, to install PVs and then maybe they will subsidize a part. And um, the last one is that we will definitely have much easier time in identification of problems uh, in, in, in implementation uh, process. So uh, that's uh, more or less uh, from my side. I will not uh, now go uh, through this part of the application because it is really a mess. So, uh, but um, I'm sure that in the future when it will be open, I will, I will be happy to share share it uh, with with you. So yeah, that's that's on, on my side. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, I think it will be really inspiring for the for ePlanet partners uh, on the user's perspective and what could be uh, uh, further developed. We don't have much time, but maybe we can time for, for the ones that can stay. Uh, we can take a few questions. Um, so I will just share the slides. Uh, so you can go on Slido and uh, and ask your question to the to the speakers to the presenters of today. Um, so yes, we have the one from Marta that we already answered. Um, we have uh, maybe how may if you want to take yeah. the floor to explain your yeah. Yeah, well, this is not really a question that um, I I forgot to mention that everything with it is open access and. I just posted the link of our repository in case anyone wants to get the code or use it or have it just uh, because I wanted to point that out. Perfect, thank you. We will also share the, the PowerPoints and the presentation to everyone after so they uh, they will be able to to have access to it. I don't see any question coming. Maybe it was all crystal clear. That's why uh, people don't ask questions. You can also um, uh, take the floor and just uh, ask you qu your question out loud if uh, if you want, if needed. Okay. So I think uh, no questions. Um, you can also reach out to us uh, afterwards uh, if you have questions. Uh, I'm sure you, we can uh, we can um, transmit the question to the to the to our um, our speakers today. Um, and just before uh, closing the meeting. Um, um I, I would just ask you to please stay a bit longer if you can and uh, share your feedback with us through this slider questionnaire it's very short uh, and it helps us um, improve the stakeholder forums um, so that it uh, fits better to your needs and so meanwhile i will uh, take again uh, all the speakers for the very interesting and inspiring presentations but also thanks uh, to all uh, of you participants for attending our events. Um, our next stakeholder forum will focus on renewable energy potential. Uh, no, on um, will focus on on financing uh, the the energy transition. Uh, so we will uh, keep you informed. Uh, but you can also follow us on social media uh, if you want to be sure to not not miss it. And any um. Anyway, uh, I would uh, um, wish you a good rest of the day and do not hesitate to reach out to me if you have any uh, remaining question or or any, any anything related to ePlanet or stakeholder forums or today today forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you very bye. much. Goodbye. Thank you. I thank you everyone.